The agenda this week asked whether Canadian universities stood to benefit from a so-called Trump bump, examined what happened to the democratic dreams of the Arab Spring, debated what reasonable accommodation for Ontario students looks like, and tuned into hip-hop legends, the Dream Warriors. The agenda's week in review begins in conversation with civil rights activist and radio pioneer, Denim Jolly. I actually don't want to start from the beginning of the book. I want to start closer to the end, which was the big struggle you had to get that radio station going. You bid the first time and lost. You bid again a second time and lost. Couldn't get the frequency from the CRTC. Why do you think it was so hard to make that thing a reality? I think the CRTC was a little nervous <clears throat> because uh, no one like us, our, they'd never seen an application like uh, ours before. What did that mean, <clears throat> an application like ours? Uh, they'd never seen a black broadcaster in Canada, and they were a little nervous about it. Nervous about what? About it being a success. They like to have uh, successful, they like to choose successfully. And so uh, they were nervous about it. Also, the <clears throat> type of music that we were offering to play was not played in Canada, and they were nervous about that too. Well, in fact, when you went in to sort of make your presentation and told them what your theme was going to be, I guess somebody asked you, what is black music? Do you remember how you reacted when you heard they, that question? They did. I was flabbergasted. I thought, uh-oh, uh, not good. But, uh, but we gave them an answer. And uh, I still, sometimes I rationalize it to say, well, you know, uh, they like to, at these inquisitions, they like to ask questions for the record. So. Maybe they wanted it for the record. You got beat by a country music station. That's right. You got beat for a frequency in the city of Toronto by a country music station. Yes. What did you think when that happened? I thought uh, they were not in touch with reality, <laughs> not in touch with Toronto. No kidding. Because uh, even the chairman, first time in history he'd ever wrote a dissenting opinion. Keith Spicer. Yes. And he said, um, what are you guys talking about, if I could paraphrase him? This, this should have been done 10 years ago uh, to celebrate the grand diversity of Toronto. But um, nevertheless, they did. And the funny thing about that was, at that time, 18 uh, commissioners were at the CRTC. They usually sent five out in the field for a hearing. And none of the five that came out to listen to her actual words, although, as, as I said, they have records, None of the five that came out actually voted for that station. It was the 13 that stayed back in Ottawa. Any that, of those 13 that, people happen to be African Canadians who that, voted against you? Are you kidding me? Not a one. <laughs> Not a one? No. Not a one. I don't believe in African Canadian. Well, I think Phil Fraser might have served on the uh, CRTC once. Phil Fraser. Yeah. Remember him, yeah. yeah. Alberta. Yes. Human Rights Commission right. in Alberta. And he was here yeah. as the president of Vision. Right. When you finally, for the third time, applied and won. How'd you feel about that? Oh, well, Father, things have changed. They've finally woken up. They've seen the light. And um, here we are. Any great sense of vindication? Very much so. Because uh, at that time, there were artists that were uh, very popular, but not on the Canadian airwaves. And uh, there were a lot of people tuning in to WBLK in Buffalo. In fact, the people who would have rhythm and blues and concerts in our genre, they had to go advertise it in Buffalo to get an audience here <laughs> in Toronto. One of, the things that, um, one of the things that perhaps people with white faces in the province of Ontario didn't appreciate uh, is that there's no such thing as the black community. Right? There are several different black communities in Toronto. I'll agree with that. And you ran into, you know, you ran into some pushback from, from a number of them, right? Like the, the Jamaicans didn't necessarily like what the Trinidadians wanted played, and the Trinidadians didn't necessarily like what the Grenadians wanted played. How did you deal with all of that? Well, in the end, we played what the general audience wanted. You know, in the radio, there's a lot of testing and polling and focus groups, and we went with what they wanted. And, and also, you know, from the start, I said to them, you know, this is, we'll have two imperatives. It will have a social imperative and it will have an economic imperative. And that will be our raison d'etre. 
And so for the economic imperative, for, to fulfill a social imperative, you need to be viable. And so we went for viability. Well, in viability, when you started, I guess you could be a standalone radio station with, with a single owner and be viable, but the business has changed so much, it's all consolidated. So uh, after how many years did you feel you had to sell it? And it was changing. Yeah. And it was changing. Well, you know, we were so sentimentally attached to it that we knew probably two or three years down the road that we might have to sell it, but we didn't want to. Mm. Even when people came and offered astronomical sums of money, we were quite hesitant. But then, like you say, you know, the, the uh, there was an avalanche of amalgamation, you know, Astral and Bell and Chum, and standing alone was just not viable anymore. So you eventually sold the station, and have you listened to it lately? I've listened to it lately, yes. What do you think? Well, it's changed a bit. <laughs> no kidding. And, and uh, it would have to, you know, a taste change, um, and... When, when uh, someone like the owner, the present owner, they have a number of stations and probably more than one in the, this market, so they can't very well compete with themselves. So. No, but Mr. Jolly, I'll, I gotta tell you, I listened to the station just the other day, and when I flipped it on, do you know who was playing? Britney Spears. Okay. Now, now, that's not exactly what you had in mind when no, you set up no, no, a black-themed radio station. No, we didn't play Britney Spears, although we played Lady Gaga. Well, uh, <laughs> she's got soul. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, let's go back then. I think one of the funniest, I guess most interesting things I learned about you was why you are named, what you are named. Who are uh, you named after? I'm named after a governor that didn't leave a very good reputation in Jamaica, Sir Edward Brandis Denham. And uh, I think he uh, had such problems running the country that he died from a heart attack. <laughs> exactly. And what was life like for you growing up in Jamaica 80 plus years ago? Well, it was, for me, it was idyllic, I think. Um, we didn't have electricity or running water, but we had 300 acres of land on the beach. And uh, we could go for swims, go horseback riding, go fishing, lots of friends to play cricket and soccer with. So it was idyllic. If it was idyllic, why did you decide early in life that you wanted to move to Guelph, Ontario to go to school there? Because everyone wants to broaden their horizons, you know, and if the opportunities just were not there uh, to do that. So I had to leave the country. I didn't want to go to the United States. Why not? Uh, um, it didn't appeal to me. <laughs> you know, it's why a, not? Uh, well, I didn't like their racial policies, for one thing. And um, Canada was part of the Commonwealth, and I thought it would be an easier transition to a Commonwealth country. And so, um, and the exact situation I wanted to go to an agricultural college presented itself, so uh, I what'd, took it. What did you think of your first winter in Canada? You know, it was very uh, traumatic, because I thought, well, let's put on another shirt. <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> Put on a jacket, that didn't work. And then I, I learned the, the, the real deal. You had to have special clothing for that. We met in a neighborhood called Jane and Finch. I was just a uh, creative, young... In Toronto? Jane in Toronto, Toronto. Yeah. yeah. Jane and Finch in Toronto. I was a young, kind of, um, you know, creative, uh, graffiti, Dancing, dancing um, designing, like just trying to express myself type of dude. And um, when me and Q kind of first actually got to know each other, we were kind of got into a little tiff between each other, like, a, you know. And I think that brought about a respect because in, in, when you grow up in the hood, I grew up in, in, in such an environment where respect is everything. Sometimes you don't have a lot available to you opportunities or uh, or others so is that why respect is so important I think it's so important for that for that for that reason so it's very hard to be creative and gain respect because if you're doing something different a lot of people aren't really down for change but um, I was one of those type of guys that a lot of people in school rooted for because I would do something different and they'll be like oh man that's him doing going doing his thing oh, no, again they, 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 they'd be like yo that's that that's that <laughs> dude, man yeah 
Yeah, they I just mean, expected it. Yeah. They just expected it. So if you were in the cafeteria and there was different spots, yeah. like you know they're playing cards and gambling on one side, they're playing and chess. And gambling. Yeah, and, <laughs> two, and then on one corner they're, they're pounding on the table making beats. I would be able to go to each section, which is very unique. Uh -huh. Some of the people would just stay in their sections and would never move out. So I was playing Dungeon and Dragons chess and then you know gambling with the boys here and then graffiti and pounding on tables making rap beats on the other side so so Q, I want to ask you because mm -hmm. you know him very well yeah what do you think it is about him that allowed him to be able to move through all those different crowds I guess yeah Q. <laughs> <laughs> what allowed him to do it is that the dude was just doing what, he, what was on his mind yeah anything that he wanted to do he just did it yeah. you know and he wasn't hurting nobody he was just doing himself right he was just doing what he felt he wanted to do and it was different than everybody else um from for me we meshed because i was in a i was into dancing so battle mm -hmm. don't let him fool you he was crazy he was crazy you know what popping. i mean mm -hmm. he was, so he's a b-boy yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. oh so done. that's uh that's why you know every at, at first people be like this kid is this is a weird kid because he used to cut i used to cut his hair he used to do some crazy styles with his mm. hair so they'd be like, yo, what's up with dude's head? Yeah, I used to do all kinds of stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he didn't care. So well, it, I mean, it, even they, just, they just accepted after a while. Even when you're, um, um, I want to ask you where the name Dream Warriors comes oh, okay. from. Okay. So just keep that in your head for yeah, a second. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. But just to follow up on what you're saying, um, when it comes to um, the music industry, especially at that time mm -hmm. with rap music, doing something different, mm -hmm. I think, took uh, a bit of courage. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you agree with me? Yeah, yes, it, it I took, do. It took courage, but mm -hmm. when you're doing something for yourself, like just doing it to do it, being creative, you're not really afraid of the difference. You're hearing everything else, but you're doing what's coming out of your mind mm -hmm. and, and in your way, right? And you respect what's going on, but you're just doing it because it's fun. It's like, I'm going to try it this way. I'm going to do this way. You don't realize that, you know, people looking at you and you're like, I'm not, I, I don't feel that. Mm -hmm. And you don't care because you're not really paying attention to all of that. When you be, well, so when, when did you decide to become the Dream Warriors and where did the name come from? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, Q's name is, is Q because he doesn't speak much. We, used, we call him the Quiet Storm, so we gave him that name. So I'm surprised yeah, that yeah. he's... He's talking so much even in this interview. <laughs> but, like, Dream Warriors was a, was a name that was based off of a belief of being a warrior of your dreams. Yeah, I remember. You know, being a fighter of what mm -hmm. you believe in. We always struggle with the question of, was Dream Warriors two people? Or was Dream Warriors more than two people? So when we started to get into actually recording, I, I, I was doing backups for Mishy. Mm -hmm. Uh, back in those days, and when we started Mishimi, to... Mishimi. Queen of Canadian the queen of The queen of hip-hop. She's like, uh, you know, our, our own, mm -hmm. you know. So when we, were, when we were coming about doing Dream Warriors, uh, uh, like just building a, a legacy for Dream Warriors, you know what I mean? It, it, it kind of was like, do we, do, do we make a movement or do we just represent two guys? Do we do a whole neighborhood push or, or, or so forth? So... Me and Q just said, listen, we're just going to do it this way. And, 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 and we grabbed a few guys from around the way. It was like Blast. Yeah. Actually, um, Blast was original, one, of the, one of the original members. One of the original members, yeah. And two of the dancers, uh, Frankie and Derek, were Warrior One and Warrior Two. I'm going to explain who they are. Mm -hmm. And myself and Q. And the leader, and um, you had two more members. Yeah, so we had a five five-man group. I'll try to be quick. I'll try to be quick. <laughs> okay. So we had a five-man group, and um, the two dancers had other visions of where they seen themselves going. Yeah. Because right at that time, we weren't making any money. Mm -hmm. So the thing for us was we were performing out of the sheer passion of our own personal dreams. It wasn't based off of trying to build a foundation, and our dream wasn't trying to take over the world of rap. Mm -hmm. It was celebrating the music and celebrating what we were doing. Some people had other visions and wanted to go other ways. So we allowed them to do that. And through that process, the same Frankie and Derek became Maestro's dancers. Right. Yeah. So now, you know, Maestro's, Maestro Fresh West. Maestro, yeah, Maestro Fresh, Fresh West. West. So <laughs> in that process, we realized that, you know what? Our dream of being a warrior, it could actually, that philosophy can go for other people who don't even rap. What has happened with U.S. student interest at your university since the election last November? 
So it's interesting because we have definitely seen an increase in the number of applications and the expressions of interest, particularly at the undergraduate, less so at the graduate, although uh, particular stories around the graduate. So some increase uh, with regards to the vet medicine uh, program, we've actually seen a 100% increase. Uh, I think that's only partly related to Trump. I think there are other factors which are influencing that, not the least of which are the low value of the Canadian dollar. And it sounds odd, but the evidence we're getting is Canada's educational profile, the excellence of it, has been boosted by the high profile of our Prime Minister who promotes Canada, and we're actually seeing that filter through as well. So there's both a reaction to the environment in the United States, but also a building of that positive profile for Canadian education as an alternative. Lots to unpack as we go along there. Richard Levin, what are you finding at the U of T? So the first thing we noticed was um, a big spike in web traffic right at the time of the election. So we were getting about 1,000 visits from U.S. students before November uh, 9th, and on November 9th it hit 10,000. And you could see it bump right up around midnight, uh, just as the election results Seriously. became clear. Yeah, it was that clear. Hmm. Uh, and then, you know, receded a little bit, but still elevated. In terms of applications, and I, I should say that we've been active recruiting in the U.S. for some years, and... Um, We've, um, we've made additional efforts in the past couple of years. So it's probably not all the external circumstances, but we have seen an 80% increase in um, applications from U.S. students this year. You had Mr. Saturday Night Live doing an event for you in New York uh, recently. We did. We've been, <laughs> we've been having some uh, events in the U.S. We have one coming up in Bethesda, so we are attracting a lot of interest. That was Lauren Michaels. Lauren Michaels. Who went to That's you, right. Too. And uh, following that, we had Don Harrison from Google um, for us in um, California. Gotcha. Madam incoming president, what are you seeing at York? Well, we similarly have been seeing an increase as well. And it was interesting, we saw exactly the same pattern right after this huge increase uh, in the U.S. by 137% on the web page. Uh, we've got about a 47% increase now in U.S. applications. But I think what's really interesting is that we're not just seeing the impact in terms of the increase in applications from the U.S., but it's had a broader impact in terms of our increase in applications from uh, other leading countries. And so overall, we've seen in one year since last year a 37% increase in international applications. And it's, it's a huge opportunity for us because Canada itself has got an uh, in, you know, international education strategy. We want to increase that number to over 450,000 students by 2022. And this is an opportunity for us to really be advancing our own strategy and taking you know, advantage of the opportunity. What are you seeing at Western? Well, we have seen a bump in international student applications, but we are bucking the trend uh, on the dom uh, American side. Uh, we haven't seen uh, much movement, partly because we haven't made the uh, U.S. a focus of our efforts in terms of recruiting. So we're uh, holding steady. Do you want to make America more of a focus? Uh, yes, uh, we would like to have more U.S. students to come here. But our focus is really uh, more global. Uh, we would like to have a diverse student body, and we get uh, greater diversity if we bring students that are not from North America. Minister, do you think Donald Trump represents an opportunity for the post-secondary system in this province? I don't think there's any question that there are people, some in the States, but uh, as Rhonda said, internationally, people who, who just aren't feeling comfortable going to the United States. They see more risks attached to that decision for themselves, for their family. So we are seeing, we saw a 30% increase in the number of applicants internationally this year over last, huge increase. Uh, we did see an increase of 12% province-wide from the states. But uh, I think there are a lot of people in parts of the country, uh, parts of the world who are feeling that uh, their safety may be, they don't, won't feel as comfortable in the states as they may have before. So is it an opportunity for us? Absolutely. Our international students, we've doubled the number of international students over the past five years. So it's a big and growing part of our student population. I think we have to make sure that those students have a terrific experience while they're here, because uh, word of mouth is uh, the biggest uh, factor there is. So some of this is Donald Trump, presumably. But, I, but, I don't but think you, there's any question about that. But if you're interested in coming to Ontario from Brazil or Malaysia or China, that's got nothing to do with Donald Trump, really, does it? 
Well, it depends on who you are. Um, but I would say from the Middle East, and we're seeing a significant increase from the Middle East, we're seeing Muslim students from India who are not comfortable uh, thinking about the state. So, yeah, I think it has broader implications than just from the U.S. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I mean, our, uh, our India numbers are up, our India applications are up 60% this year. Our UAE applications are up 50. Our applications from Turkey are up 70. So uh, a lot of people are looking at other possibilities, and I think that's a great thing. You know, external circumstances change. They change, they change back. So anything that gets people looking at other possibilities uh, in a very global world is a great thing. What about for York University? York has a strong Muslim student base. Are you hearing anything about, we don't feel comfortable going to the States, therefore we're taking a second look at York? You know, I think it's more about the positive impact um, on how students view Canada. I think that what's happening in the U.S. really shines a light on Canada's commitment to inclusivity and diversity. I know at York University and many other uh, universities in Canada, we're very committed to being inclusive, to attracting international students. We're known to be approachable, to be a safe society. So I think it's the contrast about what really is now shedding light on Canada and attracting international students to think about Canada as an alternative. Great optimism six years ago, almost a complete disaster six years later. Let's start with some theories. Why? Well, basically, Arab governments uh, thwarted the revolutions and have done everything in their power to ensure that the political development process is thwarted. Uh, and I think it's come at the hand of a lot of violence. Syria is a great example of that, mm -hmm. as well as Egypt and other countries, Yemen. And uh, clearly, it's a, a way to suppress the masses from taking over power. I mean, why would you want to give up power? And unfortunately, we had, uh, the, in the case of, of Syria, a civil war that was brewed. And ultimately, that became a very important demonstration effect for other Arab governments to say, ha, 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 see? That's where your revolution will take you. So I'm the best alternative. Dictatorship is better. Stability is better. And frankly, they've uh, effectively used that propaganda to basically prevent and, ro uh, and roll back any progress made on democracy. Antif Kabursi, why did the Arab Spring fail? Well, it failed uh, because so many factors, one of which is the governments who had uh, every interest to uh, suppress and maintain their hold on power. But uh, one cannot ignore the geopolitical factors. All of a sudden, there are so many powers in the region and outside the regions. There's an opportunity here uh, to maneuver uh, to guide the change uh, in their favor. And there is also something that is also missed, and this is the failure of the Arab development model. Uh, it was based on a authoritarian bargain where, okay, you give me your voice, I give you back services. Uh, what happened is that uh, with the rent from oil coming down, with the economic difficulties, with the failure of the, this development model, they didn't have the resources. So all of a sudden, there is no public employment. Unemployment was rising very rapidly. Uh, crony capitalism in the sense that uh, firms succeed in the area by being close to power or far away in the informal sector. Uh, take the example of Egypt. Uh, the crony uh, capitalism, to speak, those who are close to the uh, authorities, uh, represents 65% of the revenues, 90% of the profit, but only 11% of the employment. Hmm. And then there is the oil factor. One dismisses oil factor. It did an incredible transformation in the area. It shifted power and influence to reactionary regimes, uh, anti-democratic regimes. I mean, there isn't a single regime, perhaps with a minor exception in Kuwait, uh, that you can consider to be democratic. But what oil does, it literally changes, reverses the relationship between the ruler and the ruled. We'll follow up a little more on the oil angle as we go along. Nergis Jennifer, what would you add to the list of why the Arab Spring failed? As an optimist with a healthy degree of pessimism, some would argue that it didn't fail yet, but it didn't produce the results that were expected. So <clears throat> what I'd like to say is this is actually the second wave of hopeful movement on the ground. The first one would be the independence. And, and Arab states and states in the region inherited certain structures for authoritarian tendencies and oppression that comes either from an imperial or, or a colonial background. So, so they kind of mastered the craft further, 
with the independence, they made very big promises. These are either rentier or what we call developmentalist states. So they're not like the state we have here, which is a regulative administrative state. They buy the citizenry, and if they cannot buy it, then they always have the military on the side waiting to step in. So there's a very long tradition of public conditioning of what happens to you if you question or if you protest, and if you're not to be bought. I think the Arab Spring was the first time where that kind of dictum was challenged. Uh, but there is enough in the society, as, as Besma was saying, that is ready to, tell, to pounce back and then bring the order back to the way it was. I must say, that's a different take than I hear from most people. Most people say, this thing failed. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and their mm -hmm. hopes were dashed, and they're very depressed about the prospects. I don't hear that from you. How come? It's a bit like French Revolution. I mean, you know, it too failed. Too early to tell. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it did, it did fail initially, and then you did have other things happening. But 200 years later, we still make a reference to it as the first moment where people rose to power, well, whatever they rose to, and then and made a claim, as opposed to going along with the established regime. So, I don't think, though, the people who are gathering in Tahrir Square were prepared to wait 200 years to see the Arab Spring that they were hopeful for. So where are you on that continuum? Well, it's interesting. You know, I was on this show in February of 2011, and I, it was the only time in my life I've actually been right. And it was primarily because I was the most pessimistic on the panel. And, I, and it wasn't, you know, because I think Arab culture is inimical to democracy. It was because the basic conditions that political scientists argue promote democracy were simply not there. One of them is oil. And another one in Egypt, I looked at Egypt, even, you know, the inspiring... Uh, revolution and crowds that are overthrown Mubarak, but you look at the, the basic authoritarian institutions, the military was still incredibly strong. So I just didn't see how you could create democracy when the military is still dominated. And the other group that was strong was the Muslim Brotherhood, which is not especially democratic. So I just, for that simple reason, it's not rocket science, um, I could not see how democracy could emerge in Egypt. In Egypt. I want to get a sense about what you think of how things are on your campus versus the way you heard it described over here. Allison, start us off. Um, well, it was interesting listening because uh, the center at which I work, we provide uh, support services to students at um, all colleges and universities in the south half of, of the province. So I get to see it not just at Queen's, but at, at lots of different institutions. Mm -hmm. And I would say we're, you know, we're seeing more and more students at, across the province who are having more difficulty with coping with, with emotions. They have, I agree, they have no uh, stress tolerance whatsoever. They have no distress tolerance, is what you said. Um, and so it makes it really difficult. If you've never learned how to cope with really small disappointments and small stresses, then once you come to university and the, the stakes are higher, everything it just feels like it's, it's a crisis. And even if it's something that, that we might say is small. What's the story in Windsor? Well, at Windsor, uh, so I'm the director of the counseling center there, so we're doing it in the trenches, working with students who are coming in. So the 15 years I've been there, definitely there's been an increase not only in the volume, but also the severity of problems that we're seeing. Um, I think part of, the, part of the issue is what Hara was talking about, this difficulty with being able to cope and handle discomfort, all right? Um, but I also think there's a kind of wider issues with respect to um, the students that are coming in. It's kind of symptomatic of what's going on outside of the university, right? And if you look at short-term or long-term disability claims in the workplace, the vast majority is a mental health now, right? So I think there's a public health issue that's also being reflected on campus as, you know, as we are a segment of society. More of it or more awareness of it? I think both. Yeah. I think we're seeing both. I think there is a more awareness of it. The Bell Let's Talk campaign, there's more at stigma reduction, which is, like Har was saying, it's good that people are coming uh, and seeking out help. Um, and students are very active in wanting mm -hmm. that uh, discussion. Yeah, and I think they're used to it, too. They're coming out of high school now, having already, or even elementary school, been accessing mental health services or counseling, and they're coming in, right? Um, but I think the important point is that Universities are taxed, right, in terms of trying to meet this demand. Like, I, even leaving, for coming here, we're in the midst of exams coming up, right? The end of semester, this is our busiest time of year. And you're looking at waiting lists of upwards of sometimes three up to four weeks sometimes. So when you say busiest time of year, you mean for your services, for, yeah, the needs exactly, by the, the needs students that, there. the students are coming in. What's your sense based on, I mean, obviously you don't work at a university now, but your university experience is not that far in the rearview <laughs> mirror, and uh, you've heard what others have had to say. 
Well, certainly the side I tend to see of it are the complex cases mm -hmm. uh, that are uh, really um, proving challenging for mm -hmm. universities to handle. Um, there's no question, I think, that there has been an uptick um, both in university environments and in um, employment environments, because I'm mm -hmm. also an employment lawyer, um, in uh, the range and complexity of accommodation issues that arise, um, and in mental health issues in particular. Um, it's difficult for me to say I'm not an educator, but certainly I do think that the fact that there's more awareness around these issues, that people do feel more comfortable bringing forward the concerns that they're experiencing, uh, could certainly be driving some of the numbers. But certainly what I hear from academic administrators time and time again is that they do perceive that the current uh, generation of students are more stressed for whatever reason uh, than those who came before. Well, Allison, I read the title of Hera's book. Mm -hmm. And uh, the suggestion there seems to be that we've got a continent of parents here that have nurtured uh, a whole generation of wimps. Does it look that way to you? Well, I think you can't, it, not all of them are like that, but I think we have mm -hmm. a lot more parents, as, as Harriet was saying, who they don't want their children to fail. They're so afraid of having their children fail. And also, they, they don't want their kids to go through the same stresses and heartaches and, and frustrations they did. So they want to, to as, as Harriet was saying, they want to smooth the road. But what's mm -hmm. happened, and you talk about this in your book, is they've raised them in this hothouse or this greenhouse. They've got, they, they have never been buffeted by wind or rain or any bad conditions. And the problem is, anyone who's a gardener knows, if you take a, a plant out of that and stick it outside, it's going to get sunburned and die within a day because it has no hardiness. And so I see a lot more students who, who don't have that hardiness. And, and parents, by trying to help them, don't. So I have, I don't know if you want an example, but I had one student this year whose, whose dad was really wanted the best for him and had sold his house and was going to move to where his son was going to school. And uh, because he was going to make sure he got up on time, and he, he was going to do his laundry for him, and he was going to make his meals, and he was going to make sure he did what his homework. We've been on this for years. And, and oh, yeah. We have, we, have parents, is... we have parents who want to live in residence with their kids. Yes. We have parents who drive two and a half hours every weekend to come and do their kids' laundry, their home, help them with their homework, buy their, you know, cook their meals, do everything. You're, you're not kidding here. I, no, I'm not kidding here. But the so anyway, so this so Olympic soccer training program in the United States, their parents won't leave the soccer camps when they drop them off. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, hmm. so it's anyway, so this, this, this dad everywhere. was, you know, and, and it turns out he, he said, well, I, I have to do this because I, he can't fail, you know, and, and you know, I won't allow him to fail. So I said, you know, I, I really don't mean this badly, but what happens if, if God forbid, you, you get hit by a bus tomorrow, how is he going to learn how to do this stuff for himself? Mm. Oh, I, I never thought of that. So then as we get talking, it turns out that he, the father had gone through the same stresses in college and had failed in first year. And he said, well, that was what really changed my life and made me work harder and get through. So I said, well, hold on. You're telling me that was the thing that helped you succeed, but and you you're weren't going to let your that. son of that. Well, but yeah. it was hard. Well, yeah. I know it was hard, but that actually <laughs> helped you learn how to cope. <laughs> and so... In, you know, what is it? You, you, you get killed by kindness, that, that you, you're trying mm -hmm. so hard to, to make sure they don't ever have any stresses. They don't know how to cope with anything. That is the agenda's week in review. You can see all of those conversations at tvo.org, on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda. And now thanks to our nightly Twitter live stream on our Periscope page at periscope.tv slash the agenda. Monday on the program, we're looking at Ontario farmland you may never have thought about. We'll be in northeastern Ontario to talk to farmers in Kapaskasing about what it would take to turn the clay belt into a new green belt. Hope you can join us for that. And that is the agenda for Friday, March 31st, 2017. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit tvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.